If you'll open your Bibles to chapter 3 of Lamentations this morning, we continue our series on Lamentations. Why? Well, Lamentations comes from lament. And what happening? what is happening is uh, the prophet Jeremiah is lamenting the overthrow, the besieging of Jerusalem and Judah because of their sin. The Babylonians have come down, they've destroyed the city, they've taken their greatest people, their most talented, youngest people, back up to Babylonia. And everything is destroyed around him. And as he dwells in darkness, he is lamenting the fact that things are not supposed to be as they are. We're doing this in the midst of Lent. Lent is taken from a Latin word which means 40. Lent means 40. And it commemorates Jesus 40 days in the wilderness as he struggles against temptation. And then the 40 years that the Israelites circled all around the desert before they went into the promised land. Lent is the 40 days between Ash Wednesday, which happened this year on February 14th, up to Resurrection Sunday, roughly 40 days. It's a time of lament. How many of you grew up in liturgical churches? Liturgical churches means Roman Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Anglican, where you remembered or practiced Lent. I grew up in a Presbyterian church, but I think I was sleeping all the time. So I don't remember any of that. But I'm learning a lot about Lent now. It's a time as Christians that we lament the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, and we reflect on our own sinfulness and the need for a Savior. This week, we're not going to watch a video that we watched a couple weeks ago just for the sake of time, but I want us to look at chapter 3 for three applications of what we can practice during our time of Lent. If you turn to to Lamentations chapter 3, which is the longest chapter in the book. 66 verses, where the first and second chapter, the fourth and fifth chapter, is 22 verses. And I want to put this out as a challenge for us as we go through the last three or so weeks of Lent, that you read a chapter of Lamentations per day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, five chapters. It took me three minutes to read the first chapter yesterday. Now, if you're, if you're a geek like me and like to get into the study Bible, it usually takes about five to seven minutes, except for, you know, the middle chapter with 66 verses. If you look at an hour program today on TV, it's 44 minutes, an hour program, because 16 minutes are given to commercials. That's why I love the DVR. It really helps. But in that 16 minutes, you can take time and read, we all can, one chapter just to let God's Word wash over us. And I'm going to start chapter 3 and look at verses 5 through 8, and then verses 21, I'm sorry, and then uh, verses 17 and 18. Listen to God's word. Jeremiah says this. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out or cry for help, He shuts out my prayer. Have you ever felt like that in your own life? That you pray and you're surrounded and dwelling in darkness and you seem like uh, when you lift up those prayers to God, they hit the ceiling and come back down and you feel like God is not hearing your prayers and you're having to wait in that darkness where you dwell. Well, Jeremiah felt the same way. If you look in your bulletin and turn over from your order of worship, you'll see uh, an outline that you can follow. And the first point that I want to bring out from these verses is 
as we practice lament, as we practice Lent, we need to be real with God. Be real with God. Look at Jeremiah, the the weeping prophet. He was experiencing in himself the anguish of God's judgment upon Judah. Do we lament the United States of America and what's happening today, the opioid addiction and the crisis, the practice of abortion, over a million are aborted a year in our country, 3,000 a day? What about the porn industry? $15 billion a year that they have in profits, which is more than the NFL, the NBA, and MLB combined. All their profits here in America. Dean gave some of these statistics a couple of weeks ago, the sex trafficking. You know that 240,000 girls and children and little boys are at risk every day for kidnapping and sex trafficking. That's your children, that's my children, that's your grandchildren, that's my grandchildren, that's your nieces and nephews, that's my nieces and nephews. That's the kind of society we live in today. Do we ever lament that? It's good to be angry about it. It's not the way it should be. Righteous anger is good, but that's not where it should stay. We should go from anger to lament to prayer. If anything's going to turn this country around, it's not politics. It's not our voting, although that's important. It's the prayer of the church, and it's the church. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says this, If my people who are called by my name will seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Why is our land the way it is? Because the church has not been what the church should be. The church should be a beacon of the gospel. That's why I love Billy Graham. He preached the pure gospel. We need to live and preach the gospel, and we need to pray as a church. Western America, the churches are are built on programs, and they're not built on prayer. Programs are important, but we need to pray, and we need to gather together in prayer to cry out for ourselves, to cry out for our churches, to cry out for our nation. That's the way things will change. How many people show up at 7.30 on Wednesday mornings here, the first and third Wednesday, to pray for revival in our community? I tell you how many. Me, another person, and maybe two or three other people. 7.30 to 8.30. I know you got to work, but if you're really consumed by passion of what's happening in America, come and pray with us. Pray with other groups in the city. We need a great prayer movement in Pittsburgh. We need a great prayer movement in this nation if we're going to see things turn around. Look at the mega disasters that are happening in the United States. This year, it costs the United States $400 billion in disaster. It's rising every year. Floods and hurricanes, so forth and so on. Fires all over California. It's going up every year. Do you think God's trying to get our attention as Christians? When are we going to pray? When are we going to lament? When are we going to turn to God? When are we going to repent as a church and personally? Be real. As I'm being real with you, we need to be real with God and real personally with God. Secondly, look at Lamentations 3, 21 through 24. Even in the midst of of the destruction of Jerusalem, in the midst of this book, at the very center of this book, we find hope and we find the gospel Because God is always present. And this is what the prophet says. Yet this I call to mind, starting at verse 21. And therefore I have hope. 
Because of the great God, Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. That's why we sang that first hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. God's faithfulness is always here for his people. I love Psalm 136, and I think we're going to put it up on the screen. Psalm 136. It's 36 verses with this continuing refrain, His love endures forever. And that applies to you and to me as God's children. And what I want to do is I I just want to read the first part, and I want you to repeat the italicized part as if you mean it and really believe it. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. Who by his understanding made the heavens. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. Let that just wash over you. That his love endures forever. And he wants the best for you. He wants the best for his church. He wants the best for this country and for the world. Because his love endures forever. It's always there. I, I, I just love to hear the numbers of people saying that together. To be reaffirmed. That second point is to be reaffirmed of God's love. Several practical ways I think we can be reaffirmed of God's love. First of all, we need to be born again. Have you been born again? Do you know Jesus? Some of you know the time and the day. Others don't know, but you know that you've been born again. It means born from above. I remember John Wesley kept preaching, born again, you must be born again, you must be born again. An old lady in the church came up to him and said, why do you keep preaching? You must be born again. And he said, because you must be born again. (laughs) If you've given your life to Christ, this is the time to do it. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And then you need to be in God's Word daily and in prayer. Spend time alone with the one you love, who loves you more than anyone. Just, just, just let His presence soak in and over you. And then I believe you need to be in a life group, a small group. We can't do it alone. I, I, you know, I need to be real with those I can trust, and, and those are the small groups I'm in. You and I need to be in a life group. We've got the master connector here, Jason Scott, who's going to be greeting out there in the back. If you're not in a life, 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 a life group, go to him like a magnet. He'll sign you up. He is a great connector so that you're not alone in life. Be reaffirmed. And also, I believe we need to be in weekly worship. A life group is not a church. It's a life group. You know, the, 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 the statistics today from Barna Research is biblical evangelical Christians are in church 1.2 times a month now. 1.2. I, you know, I don't know how they get that average. Maybe it's one time and then you go in for the announcements and leave, and that's once a month. I don't know how they get that stuff or, or work it out. But we need to be in church each and every week because we need to say scripture together. We need to pray together. We need to sing together. We need to hear God's word preached together. There's something about the power of togetherness that we're not alone. And then finally, look at Lamentations 3, 40 through 42. Jeremiah says this, Let us examine our ways 
and test them. And let us return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven and say, we have sinned and rebelled. When you and I dwell in darkness, when we're going through lament, we need to be real with God. We need to be reaffirmed by his love, and we need to repent. Repent and believe the gospel. We don't hear that that word very much, do we, today? Because it's not psychologically the right thing to do. You're supposed to have great self-esteem and do it yourself. The greatest self-esteem you and I can ever have is God-esteem. And that's when we repent. What repent means is to turn from sin to God. Sin leads to death. To turn from death to life. To turn from darkness to light. Repentance is a great hopeful thing. It's nice to be clean. And it's only the blood of Jesus Christ that can cleanse us from any sin and all sin. And yet we need these life groups to keep us accountable that we might not walk as the world, but that we might be holy as he is holy. We're to be different than the rest of society because we've been called into the light. And light convicts other people who do not believe. We're to act differently. And I need your help to do that. When both of my sons uh, graduated from Grove City College right up the road, I took them on their senior trip. John Hunter wanted to go to all the, all the stadiums and you know, the, the, some of the major league stadiums and the minor league stadiums. So we took a, a week and we went to a ball game every day. That was great, man. I really enjoyed that because I'm a baseball fanatic. Pray for the Pirates. <laughs> man. Evan wanted to hike in the wilderness. He wanted to go to the UP. Do you know where the UP is? Upper Peninsula. I, you know, I'd never been there before. It's like 12 hours north. He wanted to be a rugged he-man and hike. So we went up to the Upper Peninsula to hike for a week. And uh, we, we stayed in this little dumpy hotel the first night. It's like $25 and, and had carpeting in the bathroom. If you ever have carpeting in the bathroom, it kind of shivers your timbers, you know, like, oh, man, should I go in there? You know. <laughs> and then we got our 40-pound backpacks on, and we went for a hike. And luckily, before we went, somebody said, you need to get fly nets on because the flies will just eat your skin up. So we had the fly nets on. Every day, we hiked five to eight miles, five to eight miles. And finally, the light, it's beautiful, picturesque. I mean, the cliffs and Lake Superior and, and all that. And you get out by the coast and the flies go away. So it's really, really pretty. And finally, we couldn't take the flies anymore. And Evan said this, Dad, we got to get out of here. This is pretty, but I can't take it. He said, he, and I said, you think you can't take it? <laughs> so the last day we hiked 14 miles, 59 years old, carrying a, fi, uh, carrying a 40, 40 pound backpack. I was going and going and going. Finally, about seven or eight miles, I said, Evan, just call the Lord to take me home. I can't do it anymore. And I just laid down. I, I actually fell down on my back with a backpack like that. Like, you know, just, I can't go any farther. And he said, okay. He took the backpack. And he had his backpack on the back and his on the front, or mine on the front. And he hiked with 80 pounds the last seven or eight miles. And what a he-man, you know. I just, we finally got done. Got in the car. I said, I'm not going back to that flea bag hotel. <laughs> so we're going to go to a nice hotel. Man, we went to a hotel, 200 bucks a night. 
clean bathroom, no carpet on the floor in the bathroom. We took a hot shower. Each one was in there for about a half an hour. Then we went to the hot tub and laid in there. And we, after a week, man, we were stanky. We needed a shower. We needed a hot tub. And it felt so good to be clean. That's what repentance is. It's being clean or cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. I want us to look as we prepare for Holy Communion. Look again at the back of your bulletin as we examine ourselves. And, you know, maybe you want to write down some sins you want to give to the Lord. And, and after our service today, after you give hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Moody Choir, there's... Um, some buckets out there beneath the cross. If you want to ball up your sins and just throw it, throw it in that bucket, get rid of it. We're not going to look at it. We'll probably burn it. Get rid of it. But as we examine ourselves, I'm going to ask these three questions of all of us. How have I sinned against God and my neighbor? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Have you not loved him with everything you've got? Have you held grudges or been jealous of a neighbor? Maybe you've not been intentional with your neighbors. Maybe you haven't reached out to them, even invited them to church. Secondly, how have I sinned against the church? Because Jesus said this, I tell you, Peter, on this rock, that is faith, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Have you not attended church in a regular manner? Maybe you need to repent of that. Maybe you've gossiped about the leadership. Dean, or or me, or Betsy, or Paul, or the elders. You know, we're doing the best we can. We we work our butts off here. And we're human. We fall. Are you lifting us up in prayer? And caring? We need that. Maybe you've not been supportive and been divisive. Maybe you've not given God the tithe or your first fruits. And finally... How have you sinned against yourself? Paul said this, For you are God's workmanship, which means masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do or walk into. You're a masterpiece. You're not junk. Don't wish to be somebody else because God created you to be the way you are. Love yourself as God loves you. Forgive yourself as God forgives you. Maybe you've hated yourself. Maybe you've given in to an addiction that's ruining your body or your mind. Write these sins down. Examine yourself. Let's pray silently together. Father, we want to be real with you this morning. And we want to repent of any sins that we might have. And Lord, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, the gentle conviction of your Holy Spirit, that we would examine ourselves and that we would truly repent and give these sins over to you. We take time as we hold the elements this morning to just listen to you and get right with you only by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.